Okay, so we now come to the second and third commonest symptoms in schizophrenia psychosis, which are delusions and hearing voices, that is, hallucinations. And the question is, what can we do for our loved ones when they're struggling with these quite strange and puzzling symptoms. So we're going to start with the delusions. Now delusions are beliefs which other people don't endorse. And they are defined as being beliefs which are held in spite of evidence to the contrary. And the other bit of the definition of delusion is that you can't argue the person out of it. So the idea is that delusions are quite fixed and stable belief structures. So how can we make sense of what a delusion is? Now, this picture really shows the idea that some delusions have got quite deep roots and they're actually maybe protecting, protecting a loved one from something that's happened in the past. The idea might be that a very grandiose delusion that you might have tremendous ability or knowledge might relate to some previous failure that the loved one can't cope with. So sometimes delusions have got quite deep roots and they have meaning in terms of a, a person's life history. What are the key principles in working with the delusion? Well, the first thing to say is that the delusion has probably got a bit of truth in it. And we all have a right to hold any belief we want to. Um, there is always a seed of truth at the heart of the delusion. So we want to find that seed and we can acknowledge that bit of truth inside the delusion and work with that bit of truth. It's good to talk about the delusion. And the more we talk about it, the better it is, because that gives us a chance to explore it and ask questions about it and try to understand it. And the more that we're able to do that, the less isolated your loved one might feel. Whatever the subject of the delusion is, we would like to learn more about it. So I'll quite often say to one of my patients with a delusion, tell me how I can find out more about this subject. I don't know much about this. It's very interesting to me. Where do you think I can get the information? So I'm going to do a bit of homework and read around the subject of the delusion and come back to that person and, and ask more questions about it. So it becomes like a collaborative investigation. We, we mustn't be colluding because we know that two things make the delusion worse. One of them is any kind of confrontation. So when the loved one detects from your attitude that you just don't believe it, that, that's perceived as confrontation and the delusion will get a bit stronger. But if you go in and say, I, I, I get it, I believe what you're saying, that is collusion and that also makes the delusion stronger. So what we want to walk is a tight rope between confrontation and collusion 
And on that tightrope, we're asking questions, we're finding out more about it, and we see where it goes. It's amazing how delusions can start to change as we explore the content without confrontation and without collusion. Now, from time to time, when you're speaking to someone with a delusion, they, they get slightly agitated. And uh, what we do there is we step back into the befriending style. And, and that is the approach of saying, of valuing the person who has the delusional belief and taking them out of the delusion for a few minutes to talk about something else, whether that might be what's happening in terms of the weather or the sports or a previous vacations. You're going to take them out of the delusion for a little bit if the subject matter, for any reason, is getting a bit heated. Now, it's widely known that delusions have emotional impact. Now, the commonest one is anxiety, but there's also lots of sadness linked to experiencing a delusion. Some people get angry about what they believe to be persecutors who are in the community somewhere and planning to harm them. So it's as if these emotions invest the delusion and kind of protect it. So what we want to do is use our ability as a family member to help reduce the anxiety, reduce the sadness or reduce the anger. So that kind of input helps. Now, it's always useful to ask an expert for someone who might have a religious delusion, perhaps that there are demons speaking to them. What we might say is, look, I, I don't know much about this subject. It sounds pretty scary, but I do know a local priest or pastor. Would it be okay? if I ask them to drop in and have a word with you about it, or maybe even a phone call. So people with delusions might not take it from us, but they will often listen to someone they perceive as an expert in the subject. So you might know these people in your community, a pastor, a priest, uh, maybe someone that's good with computers or cameras, um, a police officer, because very often the issues of persecution are important. And a police officer could tell you if there was anything like that going on in the community. Once we've done this collaborative a investigation of the delusion in a supportive way, we might gently try to test it out a wee bit and see what's happening in the community. So that's the key principles of this as a family member as to what you can do. Now it must be said, it's better always to have an expert therapist, but if you don't have access to an expert therapist or which is commoner, your loved one won't agree to see them, then you can do what you can in the background to care for your loved one using these CBT principles. So what's a secondary delusion? I've just mentioned one. Your loved one is hearing voices that are critical and unpleasant. And they come to the belief this is a demon. This has to be a demon. So that is a secondary delusion about something else. That's a delusion about the voice hearing. And that kind of delusion, to be honest, is reasonably easy to shift. 
by asking questions. For example, you're telling me that's a demon, which is a really scary idea, but how do we know it's a demon and not something else? If it is a spiritual being, might it be a ghost? Might it be something that isn't spiritual? Could it be a, a really bad dream? Because many people with psychosis say hearing things that aren't there is like dreaming awake. So might this be something to do with sleep, like dreaming while you're awake during the day? So we can ask these kind of questions and that kind of delusion usually doesn't have deep roots. That's the kind of delusion which normally will be open to questions and a bit of a look at the evidence. Delusional perception occurs usually at the start of a really big delusion. So it, the kind of example might be of someone who's going through a really tough time and they see a tree in the shape of a cross. And when they see that image, that symbol, it ushers in a delusion that they are the second coming of Christ. So delusional perception is something you see and which brings with it a big delusion. Now, obviously, if we go back to the start of a delusion, we can say, what actually was it did you, that you saw at that time? And what was happening in your life at that time? We can even go back and see that tree and see just how much it does or doesn't look like a cross. Delusions of reference are very common. The television is talking about me. That's a delusion of reference. And the question there is, is there any particular programs or TV personalities that you believe are talking about you? Because there normally are specific programs or personalities. I had a, one lady who believed that Simon Cowell was speaking about her, but nobody else. It was just that one personality. And of course, there was a reason, if you look to her history, as to why it would be the great talent spotter. So what we can do then is say, okay, you're telling me this person's uh, talking about you. Can we watch that program together so that I can understand more about it? And so we watch um, X Factor together with an open mind and we write down what Mr. Cowell says, and we try to work out which of those comments are most likely to be about the loved one. So this is, a kind, this is an interesting way to start to think about delusions. And we also have to approach this in a gentle and a graded manner. Delusional memories are quite difficult because this is where somebody says X happened 20 years ago. My house was invaded by robots 20 years ago and they implanted a bug in my brain. Now, with the delusional memory, a family member's in a great position because they probably know what was happening at that time in the loved one's life. So they can kind of say, I was there at that time. Let's have a think about that point in your life. Is there anybody else we can ask? Is there anybody else that knows what was happening at that time? Now, the big delusion, which the more you ask questions, the bigger it gets is probably one for a therapist to actually try to understand what's at the root of it. 
Now, every big delusion is there for a reason. There will be something underneath it. It will have a root. But I think it's too much to ask a, a family member to get to that root. I, I think a, a family member can work with a therapist who would probably need to see that person over quite a long period to get to the heart of it and work with the root. And if they do that, the delusion can start to have less power in the person's life. Now, there, there are some dangerous delusions. The capgrass delusion occurs when a loved one might say to a family member, you aren't my real father. He disappeared long ago. You are somebody else. You're a fake and you're an imposter. Now, oh, that's a delusion of misidentification. And if we hear that one, we need to get some help. And the other situation where we probably do want to get some help is if all of a sudden your loved one believes you are part of the delusion, then we need someone to help us work out why you've been brought into the delusion. Now, delusions about bodily function are also quite common. I had one lady who believed that there were snakes in her abdomen, snakes inside the tummy, which is pretty terrifying. And it turned out that this was a delusion about anxiety. So she actually had anxiety symptoms, which she was using the language of saying, these are snakes. So delusions are fascinating and we can learn lots about them and we can help out. So simple delusions are things like secondary delusions, delusions of reference, simple delusions of persecution. What are we gonna do with them? What should our attitude be? Well, we should be friendly. And that kind of goes without saying. We should ask questions around the edges of the delusion to find out more. For example, you tell me there's a gang in the neighborhood that are trying to kill you. Have you any idea what type of gang this is? Is this uh, a mafia type gang? Is a, a, do you think it's police? What, what, what? Give me more information about this. And I wonder how long they've been doing this for. And how do you know that they're trying to get you? What is it that you're, that you're observing? What's the evidence? So we're, we're going to try and gather information about the delusion. Um, Socratic questions are a bit more tricky. They are, you've just told me that a gang is trying to kill you, but nothing has happened to you in the last five years. How do these two things fit together? If there ever was a gang, I wonder if they've just forgotten about you now. So, so the Socratic question is about bits of information that don't quite fit together and asking the loved one how these things work. And of course, this can introduce a bit of doubt. The gang that's trying to kill them, maybe they've all grown up now. Maybe they're not interested in the loved one anymore. So we get a bit of doubt and then we can come up with some other possible explanations. So you're thinking it's a gang that's out there to get you. I wonder if it could be something else. Could it be that you were looking at your social media and because you weren't sleeping, you were misinterpreting some of the things that were on there 
maybe taking them too personally. So maybe it was lack of sleep or stress that was at the heart of this. And at that time when you said this is all starting, I think you were using quite a lot of strong cannabis. I wonder if that might have been a factor. Have you had any friends who've got paranoid after using that kind of strong cannabis? So we introduce some other explanations. And what we see here is a pie chart. And this is just a visual representation of these explanations of the delusions. So the biggest bit of the pie, your lover might say, I'm gonna give a half of the pie to the idea that there's a gang out there. I still believe that, but I'm gonna give a quarter of the pie to this idea that maybe I was really stressed out and not sleeping. And I'm gonna give a quarter of the pie to the idea that I was really doing a bit too much of the strong cannabis. So we put it in a visual form, and then when we come to think about the delusion again, we, we just put the pie chart down there and say, this is where we were last time and thinking about what you're experiencing. And then you, you move forward from that baseline. So a visual representation of the delusion and the other explanations is useful. And once we have that little bit of doubt with the delusion, we're going to start to try and test it a wee bit. So you're telling me there's a gang that are out there. So if they are trying to kill you, would you expect there to be somebody out in the street or somebody watching our house? A loved one might say, yeah, probably. There probably will be. So would it be okay if I go out and I'll take my phone with me and I'll take a little video of what's outside in our street and I'll bring the video back in and we can have a look at it and think about who these people might be that are out there. Now, if you're doing this, you've got to hope there are no shady characters out in the street, but it doesn't really matter. It's the fact of starting to test it out, looking for a bit of evidence. And the loved one is then getting little beads of evidence to consider. For the first time in a long time, they are seeing what is outside in the street because they've been hiding away. They've had the curtains closed and the headphones on and, and they're just not been in contact with what is out there. So having decided that there's maybe not too many people out there that look threatening, maybe the loved one might decide to have a look out the window themselves and explore the idea a bit more that maybe none of these people are too threatening and maybe there were other causes for the way that they felt. Now, when we do this, this kind of testing it out, and it needs to be very, very gentle and very, very slow and done easily and with full agreement that it's a reasonable thing to do. Normally the bits of the pie change a bit. So you might find that the idea that this is a gang has now only got a quarter of the pie. And now a half of the pie is maybe it was that cannabis. And a quarter of the pie is maybe I was too stressed out and lacking sleep. If it was the cannabis that's done this, then there's a few implications there. Maybe it's safer to go out than I thought. And maybe I should lay off the cannabis for a bit to let the brain recover. So when we're asking questions about a delusion, the import, there's a lot of important things about it. It's got to be done in a sensitive, respectful and genuine way. But it shouldn't be done like Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes knew it all. He was way ahead of everybody else. 
Columbo, if you watch your detectives, he's, he's kind of behind everybody else. And he's saying, how does this work? How does that work? And uh, he's very unthreatening. So Columbo would be a good questioner of somebody with a delusion. I think you know that Columbo style. So as we start to ask questions, the underlying view is, could this actually be true, this delusion? Or is it partly true? Might there be some truth in this? If you think about the, the idea about the gang and the persecution, there is quite a lot of feeling of threat in the community just now. And maybe that's what they're detecting up. So, so, so there'll be a bit of truth in there somewhere that we can work with. Curiosity is a key word. I'm going to be curious about this belief, learn all I can about it so I can understand it and respect the person's right to hold it. And they may, after we've done a, a bit of talking and thinking about this, they may decide to still hold it. So I can't force that person out of their delusion. They themselves may learn enough and test it out enough that they decide to change it, but I can't make them change it. Now, any bit of the statement which is said that is true, we should validate. So if someone says to me, there's a gang out there that's, that's trying to kill me, I, I can say, yeah, gang culture is, is a, a terrible thing. Uh, and it's often linked to drugs and criminality. So, I mean, that's, that's the truth of it, isn't it? But the question is, what about this gang that he's talking about? What is your loved one's view about this particular gang? So anything that they say that is true, validate it and ask questions about the rest. This increases our joint collaboration. If the loved one can give you good evidence for something, we should be open to think about that. And we might even change our belief a little bit. I've learned loads of stuff in the last 30 years by talking to people with delusions and learning more about those subjects. So I'm going to come across as someone who is able to shift, someone who is open to the evidence and open to learning about this subject. And I'm going to normalize that these kind of paranoid thoughts, delusions are actually very common. They can change. People can change their beliefs. It's okay to vote. Republican one year and Democrat next time. People can change their beliefs and vice versa. So here's an example of a delusion. Um, David believed that a satellite was taking the thoughts out of his mind and broadcasting them into the street where people would pick them up. He was very distressed and preoccupied and he also heard voices and he was socially withdrawn and he had stopped caring for himself. So, so this is a first episode of psychosis. So what can we do? Well, let's talk about the satellite. Let's ask questions. You're telling me, David, that there's a satellite up there that is pulling the thoughts out of your mind and projecting them into the street. I've never heard of anything been able to do that before, but it's obviously a very frightening experience. Tell me about the satellite. Is it something that you can see? Have you, have you seen it up there at any point? And if so, what does it look like? And I wonder who or which country 
might have paid for such a satellite. And I wonder how long a satellite will stay up in space. I wonder if eventually they crash to Earth or if they can stay up forever. Let's find out more about satellites and what they can do. So in this way, you're, you're, you're collaborating, you're working on the material of the psychosis, but you're not colluding with it. You're not saying, yeah, maybe satellites can do that because I've never heard of one that could do that. And uh, you're not confronting it by saying, I think we both know that's not true. So we're not confronting or colluding, we're learning more about the experience. And it can be very useful. The idea of thought broadcasting is a very, very common delusion in schizophrenia psychosis. And it can be good to compare it to something. Do you mean something like telepathy? I've heard of telepathy. It, it's a kind of trick that you see magicians doing. Telepathy is where your thoughts are transferred. Is that what you're meaning? I wonder if we can find out about telepathy, how common it is, what's actually the evidence? Can people project thoughts? Let's find out more. This experience you have of your thoughts going out, how often does it happen? Is there any pattern to it? So here we say, let's keep a diary of the experience. A very simple diary. Whenever you feel those thoughts going out, let's just write down the time of day that it happens. You can't get simpler than that. And we might see therefore that this is happening maybe five or six times each day, but not in a regular pattern. It's probably when it's been triggered by stress or, or, or some other memory of a difficult situation, but certainly not the regular pattern of a satellite. So the diary is a uh, quite useful. What evidence do we have the thoughts are going out? Well, is it something about how people react? If so, could I stand at the window and watch the reactions of other people? and bring that information back to you. You've said it's a satellite, could it be something else? Might you have seen a meteor or a bright star in the sky? Could it have been an aircraft or the NASA space station? If you saw something, could it be something other than a satellite? Now the whole principle of working with delusions is to take the correct attitude and get your toe in the door. Once the door opens slightly, certainty has gone, and then you have opportunity and flexibility to think about other possibilities. And when my patient allows me to look out the window, I don't see the kind of reactions David expects. He expects people will be disgusted and frightened and probably moving away from the house. And the few people that were there didn't react at all, which came as a great relief to him. Maybe his thoughts don't actually go that far. If they leave his head, maybe they just stay within a 10 yard radius. Well, that feels a bit better. So, if the delusion does shift to a less extreme belief, we, we support the person in that new belief. So moving on to voices. How can we make sense of what's happening with voices and how can we help our loved ones understand them and deal with them? Now, Language is the highest human function and hallucination is extremely common. So humans hear voices for all kinds of reasons and there's different voices that they hear. 
So we need to be fairly open-minded on this subject of voice hearing. A narrow approach to it will not be appreciated. Okay, from the point of view of very critical, unpleasant hallucinatory experiences, there's often an unprocessed trauma at the background. It might be bullying, it might be bad or intrusive treatment at school, it could be that something sexual has happened at some point, something they haven't dealt with, or maybe a bereavement they've never grieved over. And the brain hasn't been able to deal with the memory or the emotional pain. That can come out as voices. And that is often what our loved ones are dealing with. Sometimes it's about conflict. There might be conflict within a peer group, that there might be bullying, there might be all kinds of conflict over a relationship with a, a girlfriend or a, a partner. And maybe they've never been able to solve that conflict and that can come out as arguing voices. Now, all world religions say that there are spiritual voices which aren't illness-based. So that's another type of voice we have to accept that people can hear. Sometimes very creative people have intuitions that seem to come from nowhere and very creative impulses which can appear as voices or visions. So a, a number of groundbreaking scientists have these strange experiences which are quite close to voice hearing. Albert Einstein said he didn't come up with his ideas, they came to him. Then there are positive voices, voices which are complementary, voices which will say, you're doing well, you're a good person, um, don't listen to some of the things those other voices are saying. So we have positive voices in the mix. And then we have the biggest problem, the kind of critical and commanding voices, which might tell a loved one to hurt themselves or cut themselves or hurt somebody else. Now, those types of voices are again often linked to traumas that haven't been dealt with or stresses that haven't been managed. And sometimes voices can turn and become healing. There's a famous story of an actor whose voices talked him out of his alcoholism. Voice, voices are an amazing subject and we should approach it with a very open mind. Now, one of the problems about Western culture in terms of hallucination is that all of the beliefs that which are embedded in our culture are negative. Voices are a sign of madness. Voices are dangerous. If you're hearing voices, something bad's going to happen. Voices are supernatural. Voices cannot be controlled. So whenever anyone starts to hear a voice within their culture, these are the beliefs that flavor their interpretation. Now, there are many first American first Australian cultures where the beliefs about voicing are completely different when voices are seen in a positive way and they're welcomed and not seen as being dangerous. So the normalizing approach is very useful to take these very negative beliefs away and replace them with voice hearing is very common, voice hearing usually recovers, voice hearing 
may well be trying to tell you something. That is, it's a burglar alarm about something that's gone wrong, too much stress, too much trauma, whatever. So just to mention about the bit of the brain that is actually causing some of the problems here. There is a bit of your brain that's dealing with the world ahead of your conscious mind. And this is the amygdala. So if something dangerous happens, your amygdala has already seen it. And it's already got you ready for fight or flight. It's activated all your systems. And then your consciousness comes on stream. Now, the amygdala is linked to the insula and it gives you a quick response. So sometimes your emotions seem to be ahead of the game. So you'll feel grief, anger, shame, guilt, envy, and, you, and you're kind of surprised where it's come from. It's because the amygdala is in touch with your memory and it's sizing things up. It will activate you and get you ready for things you need to do. The amygdala has access to all your memories of trauma. All the things that you haven't processed in the past are stored up there. The frontal bits of the brain can deal with the amygdala and produce a degree of control over it. But we know that in schizophrenia psychosis, the frontal areas aren't working so well. And basically the amygdala overheats. Now, that means it can't deal with these trauma memories. It can't deal with the stress that's currently happening. It can't process them. And it flicks the switch on the insula. Now the insula decides what's inside your body and what's outside. So if the amygdala overheats, the insula switches off and your thoughts are distorted and appear as language outside the body. That's what voices are. Now, if our loved ones could understand how that works, that would be a real breakthrough. But for many people, this model is a bit too complex. that They can't quite get how the brain might work in this way. And when the insula, the amygdala overheats and the insula chucks the thought and the language outside, it does distort it. And it's distorted by all the old painful memories and stressors. And here we have a case of a, someone listening to their voices in an fMRI scanner. So in the first picture, you can see it's the language areas of the brain that are lighting up. So I would show this to a loved one with hallucinations. I would say, when you're hearing that voice, your brain is producing what it thinks is speech. These are the language centers in the brain. Now here we have a second scan, same person listening to their voices after nine months of cognitive behavioral therapy. And what's happened here is that the brain is no longer overheating. So we have a 30% reduction in the activation of the cortex. It's calmed right down. And the amygdala and insula are working normally again. So therapy can change the way the brain functions and allow it to normalize. So th these sorts of pictures, I think, could be very useful for some loved ones with voice hearing so they can understand what is actually going on. So what are the key principles of caring for your loved one with hallucinations? Well, first of all, appreciate the fact that what they say they're hearing seems absolutely real to them and that their voices are unique to them. So it, they are about something and, and there will be things 
that we can learn from those voices. We should always engender hope and normalize. The human brain easily hallucinates and usually recovers. Ask if the voices vary, if there are times that they go quiet, or if there are times when they get more angry and critical. Let's see if we can track that. If there are quiet patches in the day, are there any common factors as to when the voices are quiet? This might be the beginnings of a coping strategy. So we're interested in voice diaries, the quite simple diaries where you can chart what voices are doing. Could we write the voices down? Might that take the sting out of them? Now we know that whenever you write things down, you're taking them out of your mind and onto the paper. That in and of itself is therapeutic. And I had one chap who was writing down what the voices were saying. He said, it's a good coping strategy. I do it for 15 minutes twice a day. And the different voices, I'm doing them in different colors. So it's a good distraction. But I've realized that the voices are boring. They say the same thing every single day. And he chucked the diary down. His relationship with the voices had changed. Before, he was preoccupied with them. He spent a lot of time listening to them. He was frightened of them. Not, after, not anymore, not after that diary got chucked down. He was going to go and do something with his life and manage those voices. So what we want to do is to change the relationship with the voice so that the voice is no longer dominating life. Um, ask if your loved one recognises the voice. Now, they normally don't because voices are distorted memories, but sometimes they do. And if they can recognise the voice, then that's interesting and it might tell us more about what the particular traumatic memory or stress might be. Or we might find out that it's a male of a voice maybe of a man of about 50 or 60. That's interesting. Why is the brain producing that particular voice? So there's lots of interesting things we can do by writing down voices and exploring them. Then the question is, do they tell the truth? Now, a lot of people sit listening to their voices, presuming they must be pretty accurate, but not testing it out. So we could write down some of the voices and actually look at the evidence for and against what they're saying. The voice says you're a complete loser and you've got no friends. Now, is that true or is that a bit extreme. I mean, you were doing well at school before you had this type of breakdown. How can it say you're a complete loser? And you, I mean, obviously you do still have some friends, maybe not as many as before, because you haven't been out very much socializing, but you've still got some friends. Maybe the voices don't get it right. And if that's the case, we should challenge them. We can say, no, I'm, I'm not accepting that. That's too extreme. I think you're actually bullying me a bit here. I do have some friends and I might be at a low ebb just now, but I'm not a complete loser. I'm going to recover in due course and get back to college. So we can have this sort of a dialogue of not accepting what the voices say. And maybe some of those responses could be audio taped on a mobile phone and listened to. Stand up to them a bit, do your activities, despite the voices. 
because usually when you stand up to voices, they back off. Give them an appointment each day for 15 minutes. I'm not going to listen to that just now, but at six o'clock tonight, we've got a full 15 minutes and you've got my full attention for everything you want to say. Some people can put the voices into an appointment time. And that seems to be something that is possible, but not for everybody. There's lots of voices which are too strong, too emotional to get put into that box. As we're saying, voice diaries are very useful. Um, we can either do ones about time when the voices are coming on and how strong they are, or we can write down the content of the voice. If we're writing it down, it might trigger some of the things that the voices are talking about. But that's how you get better. You realize the voices are talking about an accident that I had in my teenage years, road traffic accident, and I was hospitalized for a while, and I thought maybe I might have not survived it. I remember a lot of nurses round about me and machines, and, and the voices are talking about that. I'd never realized. I just listened to them, but they're actually talking about that episode. And in remembering that episode, we're processing it. So this allows us, through the voice diary, to access the things the voices are talking about. Um, voice diaries might help show us periods of time when the voices are quiet, and that's potentially a coping strategy. The voices seem to be quiet when I'm doing a bit of cooking. Okay, let's spend a bit more time cooking. Let's cook for other people. Let's say, make the best things we possibly can. Maybe there's a beginning of a coping strategy there. Now, it seems to be the case that when voices are speaking, there is an image in the mind linked to the voice. Let's draw it. Let's draw that image and try to work out why it is so unpleasant. It's normally quite an unpleasant image. It might be an image of a devil or a demon or, or some kind of criminal or something. And uh, we can change images. We can say, let's, when the voices are speaking, let's replace that unpleasant image with a pleasant image. And that can help. Um, voice diaries, we don't want really complicated ones that are too difficult to do. That is pointless. Voices are a good target for CBT informed caring and for cognitive therapy. Um, voices can get better. They can get better within therapy. They can get better within caring. Sometimes they go away on their own for reasons unknown. Sometimes a change of attitude is really important. It's that changing the relationship with the voice. And people that I've spoken to who have fully recovered say that they still get the voices, they're not as strong, and they interact with them by selectively listening to bits that are pertinent to them and interesting and otherwise getting on with life. Voices can get better with a medication change or voices can recede after a life event. I've seen people change accommodation and being in a new environment, maybe with uh, maybe moving from being on their own in the community to being in a supported environment where there are staff, where there's, there's more support there, and that can really help the voices recede a bit. I've seen people get into a new relationship or have a child, and that life event 
allows voices to improve. We should be hopeful that voices are going to change. So here's an example of somebody. Linda heard voices telling her to cut herself. Voices said she was useless. Her parents were distressed, understandably so, and kept begging her not to cut herself. This seemed to make the voices worse. And the home situation was getting very frantic and there was a lots of feelings getting expressed. So what we need to do here is try and make the situation as safe as possible. Try to get the family to move into neutral, to say, right, okay, well, how can we work our way through this? Do a voice diary, find out what the pattern is, see if there's a coping strategy there, and try to change the relationship with the voice. You're telling me to cut myself. Why? What kind of person tells somebody else to do that? Look how much you're upsetting my family. I'm not going to do it. Now, what happens as the loved one stands up to the voice and keeps standing up there is that the voice increases a bit and then it starts to fade. So it's kind of getting over the hump and to the point that the voices will start to settle down again. So we're going to have a question and answer session, but first I want you to do a little exercise about someone called Tom. And if he was in your family, um, so Tom believes he hears the voice of the devil, giving him commands and telling him he's evil. He responds to this by spending long hours praying and he's too scared to sleep or socialize. I just wonder if you have two or three key ideas that you might be able to use as a family member to help Tom in this situation. Just to mention this resource book. Now, this is a book which has a lot of websites listed at the back and treatingpsychosis.com is the website of the book. And there's lots of diaries, information sheets, that you can download there. So if you get a chance to have a look at this book, it's full of interesting materials. And I would have thought in terms of the delusions and the voices, there'll be something there that you might be able to use with your loved one.